All right, it looks like it is right around 12. I am looking at the audience. It's great to see so many people. Oh, I'm seeing something from Mark saying on the website, one of the website links to Zoom isn't working. Oh dear. Um, Mike, do you think, could, could you have a look at that maybe? See if people are trying to get in. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. So my name is Allison Bell. I'm the leader of the GNDP theme at, um, at the IGB. And it is my pleasure to be able to introduce Ava Fisher, um, who's going to be giving the spotlight lecture today um, as part of the IGB seminar series. Welcome back to the semester, such as, as it is. Um, and it's great to kick it off, kick it off with, um, with Ava. So um, I've known Ava for a bit now, and um, it's been such a pleasure to get to know her better just over the last several years when she joined the faculty here um, in 20, 20. 20, 2020. I got that year right. right. Yes. So um, Ava's an assistant professor in the Department of Evolution, Ecology, and Behavior. She uh, did her undergraduate work at Cornell and her, received her PhD from Colorado State, where she worked on another than guppies. Um, she went on to do a postdoc. Um, at uh, Harvard and also at Stanford. And then we were very pleased to be able to um, recruit her here um, to University of Illinois, like I said, in 2020. So Ava's work is extremely integrative, asking questions about the evolution of behavior from a variety of different levels of biological organization. And I think Ava will probably be showing lots of examples in her talk today about just how <laughs> integrative one can be. Um, so Ava's already made herself an extremely valuable uh, member of our community, is involved in many departmental and IGB related activities. So um, I think we're all gonna have a great time getting to know more about her work and also look forward to interacting with her in a variety of different settings. So with that, by way of introduction, I will stop talking and introduce um, Ava, who's going to be telling us about mechanisms of behavioral evolution, lessons from poison frogs. Oh, and sorry, one more thing. Um, at the very end for questions, if you wouldn't mind putting your questions in the chat, um, then either Ava or I will read them aloud. Um, and I might ask uh, you to read the question aloud yourself if technology permits. Otherwise, Ava and I will just read them. So questions in the chat function. All right, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, thank you everyone for being here as we're all trying to get back into the swing of it and this ever-changing um, COVID situation. Um, I'm really excited to be here to get to share some of my past work and sort of introduce myself and where things are at now as I'm setting up my own lab. Um, and also it's just, I mean, it's such a delight to have joined um, the university and also be affiliated with the IGB in particular, because um, as Allison said, we do integrative stuff on kind of funny creatures. And so to, to join a place where that, like everyone was like, yeah, well, of course you would do this felt really amazing because it's certainly not everywhere that I think people appreciate the kinds of things that we're doing. Um, okay, so. We'll just jump right in. I'll start really big by um, kind of talking about my science worldview. And so, you know, really broadly speaking, um, as I'm sure are many of people in the room or in the virtual room, I'm interested in how novel traits evolve. And for me, it's particularly kind of this how that has always captured my interest in terms of, you know, not only thinking about why these traits are useful to animals, what the adaptive value of a trait might be, but also like how does it get built under the hood and also how understanding that can help us understand things like why evolution proceeds the way it does, why we see patterns of convergence the way we do, why evolutionary trajectories might be biased towards or away from certain kinds of solutions, if you will. Um, and so in particular, I'm interested in how novel behaviors evolve. And so behaviors just happen to be my favorite kinds of traits. Um, and I think behaviors pose some particular both challenges and opportunities as compared to other kinds of traits. 
And so if we choose a, you know, randomly chosen organism of interest, when we're interested in behavior, often what we're trying to do, right, is to say, okay, we've got a behavior and we've got some genes, we've got a genome. And what we'd like to do is to link variation at this um, genomic or genetic level to behavioral variation. Um, but that is pretty tricky, right? Ultimately, this is the question of resolving the genotype to phenotype map, which I would argue is a central challenge that remains to us in biological research. And when we're talking about behavior, um, there's a few things that I think are particular about it that we have to keep in mind. So one thing that complicates being able to make this connection is that, of course, genes don't act in isolation. They act inside of networks, they're talking to each other. These gene networks in the case of behavior, we're often thinking about them being active inside of neurons. Neurons are highly specialized cells, both in their form and their function. Neurons talk to each other, so different type of, types of neurons talk to other kinds of neurons, they form networks. These networks, we can also think about forming sort of larger networks inside of brain regions, which I'm depicting here as blobs. Um, and those brain regions in turn talk to each other. And so really behavior is an emergent property of these interactions across these levels of organization. And so to me, these hierarchical levels of organization introduce complexity, but they also actually, I think, provide an opportunity for us to start to think about how behavioral variation is generated and maintained. And so that's an idea I'll come back to throughout the talk. And then the other thing that's special about behavior is that it changes at vastly different timescales. So obviously animals change their behaviors all the time. They're making decisions at a sort of immediate right now timescale. But we can also think about how developmental influences, how experiences throughout the lifetime of an animal influence that animal's behavior or that organism's behavior. And then we can also think about how behavior changes um, across generations and ultimately across lineages. So at these evolutionary timescales. And so in my lab, what we really try to do is that we're trying to um, you know, hold these things in our mind and to take really integrative approaches to understand um, behavioral diversity by um, keeping these levels of organization and timescales in mind. And so there's two kind of trains of thought that I have pursued, um, you know, since I started graduate school and that um, we're continuing down on in my own lab now. And one of those, oh, and I should say, you know, other people have said really interesting and excellent things about how behaviors evolve. And so right now I'm just zeroing in on kind of two areas that we're thinking about. Um, one of them is the relationship between plasticity, so behavioral, environmentally induced plasticity and evolution. Um, and the other is thinking about how you can sort of reuse something you've got, recombine it to generate novel behaviors by deploying something existing in a novel context or a novel way. And what links these two ideas for me right now is an idea that novel behaviors might arise through mechanistic co-option. So what I mean by that is, you know, evolution never makes something from nothing, but that perhaps in the case of behaviors, especially given these layers of complexity, maybe you can take sort of a pre-existing module, a pre-existing gene ex set of genes or something and reappropriate in a new way, um, or perhaps it's plastically being activated in one context and then you can fix it genetically to be able to get novel behavior. And so this is sort of these um, broad areas of thinking that I think will come up as themes throughout the talk. And one thing that um, this idea of mechanistic co-option suggests is that shared mechanisms might give rise to similar behaviors across really different kinds of critters and or contexts. And this is something that I have, you know, thought about for a really long time, and again was a really exciting reason to show up um, at U of I and um, at the IGB because this is something that there's obviously a long, really rich, really wonderful research tradition of here. And so I'm highlighting just one paper of of many, many papers here that has um, a whole list of people on it who, of course, um, you all know. Um, and again, also just this idea that there is value to comparative work. So looking across different kinds of critters. And so again, I'm just really happy to be here and to also hopefully add um, another critter to the mix here. All right, so what I wanna to do today inside of this broad framework um, is to introduce you to my charismatic study organisms um, and then tell you about some 
previous work on mechanisms of parental care and how that's brought us to where we're at today. And then also some of our current thinking about um, feeding circuits and the evolution of social behaviors. And so along the way, I'm also really happy that I can show you sort of the first few graphs of data from my own lab, which is feeling um, exciting these days. Okay, so let's talk about the frogs. Um, so here are our delightfully grouchy study organisms. Um, as a postdoc and now in my own lab, a lot of our work has been focused on South American poison frogs in the family Dendrobatidae. There's three characteristics that we think of as sort of unifying this group. Um, first, as the name implies, they carry defensive chemicals. These are primarily small molecule alkaloids. They do not make these chemicals themselves. They actually sequester these toxins from their diet, so they are perfectly safe and non-toxic in the lab, um, but they still in the lab maintain um, and also have in the wild, obviously, this warning coloration or aposomatic coloration, so they are using this to tell you that you should leave them well alone because they carry these toxins. And then finally, and this is what people tend to be less aware of, they actually have evolved quite elaborate forms of parental behavior as a group. And so some of my previous work has been at, or ongoing work is at the intersection of these traits, but primarily we have worked mostly on this last um, parental care behavior. So given that, what does parenting look like if you are a poison frog? There's three phases that we tend to talk about. Um, the first is egg attendance. So um, terrestrial, these animals breed terrestrially. The idea in general is that terrestrial breeding evolves to um, reduce predation on eggs. But if you put your eggs out of the water as an amphibian, you need to clean them, hydrate them, take care of them. They still actively de defend them from um, terrestrial predators as well. But when those cute little tadpoles hatch out, they are still aquatic. And so the next form of parental or phase that we talk about is tadpole transport. So this is a tadpole um, here on the back of, in this case, dad. And so they carry them piggyback style to pools of water. And then finally, in some, though not all species, moms will actually visit their developing tadpoles and feed them unfertilized eggs. So we call this egg provisioning or nursing behavior, um, also a really interesting behavior. Um, and again, that is somewhat more restricted. Not all species do that. Okay, so I want to show you what these things actually look like. So here is a video in the wild. This is dad. He's got a tadpole on his back and he's cruising around deciding where to put it. So there's actually water in this hole that he's looking into, which you can't see. So he's thinking about whether this is the right place to leave his tadpole. In this case, he decides no. Um, and so he moves on. So this is a quite costly behavior. They're, they're moving long distances. Um, they're carrying their tadpoles around sometimes for hours. Um, and we also know they're making complex decisions about where to leave their tadpoles. They remember where high quality pools are, et cetera. Um, and then what you're gonna see here, this is a different species. This is in this case, mom. And you will see this tadpole is begging for food. So this nursing behavior, there's also interesting parent offspring communication that happens. This tadpole is kind of nibbling on mom, um, vibrating along her. This is an honest signal of need. Um, in the absence of this signal, mom will not lay these eggs. And so tadpoles do this to signal, hey, I'm here and I'm hungry. Okay, and then finally, um, just to give you also a sense of the tadpole side, this is a tadpole here, this is an egg, and what you will see, delicious. So these tadpoles love eggs, every you know, high little protein packet meals. Um, many of these tadpoles actually also have specialized mouth parts to be able to eat these eggs. Um, and so that is what this all looks like. Okay, so right, this is clearly like a, a, an elaborate costly behavior. Why would such a thing evolve? And so in general, right, we think that terrestrial breeding evolves um, to avoid aquatic predators, but there's also even within the family, this relationship between less parental care and more resources on the one hand and more parental care and fewer resources on the other. So if we start over here, we have species that carry their tadpoles many at a time, and they put them into these relatively larger bodies of water. Those are great because there's lots of food there, but there's also a lot of competition and there is still predation. As we move across this continuum, we have species that carry their tadpoles one or a few at a time and leave them in relatively smaller um, pools. 
At the extreme, they're leaving their tadpoles right here in these little itty bitty individualized condos, which are excellent because there are no predators and there are no competitors, but there's also virtually no food. And so we think it's at this extreme that this egg provisioning behavior evolves. So this is sort of our thinking about why, um, why these behaviors arise. And then, um, of course, as you all know, and as people in the room work on, uh, parental care is phylogenetically widespread. It's evolved in every major animal uh, every major animal lineage, um, in some cases repeatedly and independently. It tends to come in three sort of flavors, if you will, male uniparental, biparental, and female uniparental. And so given it's so widespread, you know, why the frogs? Well, one answer is that as I alluded to, you know, we're interested in comparative work um, across animal taxa, but within frogs, we're also excited because we have these three different care strategies represented in closely related species, and we also have independent evolutions of care behavior. So even though parental care is relatively rare in amphibians, it's only about 10% of amphibians that do this, um, we think there's still a really cool system um, to get at some of these questions. And in particular, the other thing which will become important in a moment is that males and females perform really similar kinds of behaviors. So this tadpole transport behavior looks really similar in males and females. And so we think that's also a nice way to be able to compare across species because who is doing the behavior differs, but what the behavior looks like is actually quite similar. Okay, and then the other thing that I just wanna point out is that um, we have also starting points to think about this work and to go looking in the brain for where things are changing um, because there are conserved brain regions and molecules um, across vertebrates. So we're going to start here with everybody's favorite, um, you know, rodent mammal model system. And so these are cross sections to, through the brain sort of taken as though you sliced the brain as a loaf of bread. The blobs are different brain regions. If you know something about these, that is awesome. If you don't, don't worry. All I want you to understand here is that there are different systems, different regions in the brain. Um, some of these are important in reward and reinforcement of behavior. Some of them we think of as particularly important in social behavior. And some of them in green here are shared by both of these systems. And so um, this has been proposed as sort of this, this, these regions all together as the social decision-making network. So brain regions important for making decisions and in particular social decisions. And so the other thing about this network then is that it is highly conserved um, both functionally and structurally across vertebrates. And so we have these really, like we knew where to go and start looking. And so there are variations here, right? It's still interesting to go in and see what's the same and what's different, but we know there is also overlap that gives us a starting point. Um, and in addition to the brain regions themselves, there are also some molecules um, that are also expressed and conserved throughout this system. So we also have candidates at that level. Okay, so that is the introduction to the poison frogs and sort of where we were at um, starting out in this system. Um, and so the first thing I'm gonna do now is talk about work on mechanisms of parental care. So when I started my postdoc, um, we had no idea about underlying mechanisms of parental care in amphibians at all, right? So we know they're doing these very cool behaviors. We don't know what's going on under the hood. And so we wanted to use the frogs as a way to ask this question, is there a general parental care circuit in the brain, both thinking just within frogs and these different species, um, and then also more broadly, you know, what's happening compared to vertebrates generally. And so to, the first thing we did was that we used this assay for neural activation, where we have an antibody that tags phosphorylated ribosomes. Ribosomes become phosphorylated when neurons are active. Um, and so this acts as sort of a general readout of neural activity. What this actually looks like um, is that um, in purple here, we've got a nuclear stain. So it shows me every single cell in the brain. Um, and then those in brown are where this antibody has bound. So these represent neurons or cells that have recently been active. And so we can use this as a proxy for neural activity and then associate that activity with the behavior we're interested in. 
And so um, we don't sort of count these brown dots in the brain willy nilly, but we count them in these specific brain regions. And so this is a schematic of the brain now sliced sort of sideways. Um, and these are, again, if you know, if these words mean something to you, that's great. If they don't, no problem. Um, these are just these candidate brain regions that are um, part of the social decision-making network. And so that was where we started looking. And so um, this is a fun slide because it's like basically my entire postdoc in a single slide. So that's a sobering way to represent four years of your life. Um, but the first things that we did was that we took a comparative approach um, in which we chose three focal species that all do this tadpole transport behavior, but they have different care strategies, biparental, male uniparental, and female uniparental. So who is doing this behavior differs, and that's what the little um, symbols here are telling you. Um, and what we did was that within species, we compared animals who had parental experience, but were not currently parenting to those that were actively transporting their tadpoles. And we said, okay, what parts of the brain are different in activity during this tadpole transport behavior. And so here's my little brain schematics that I'm using. The colored blobs are brain regions that showed differences in activity. There are shared things and non-shared things here. Um, lots of detail I'm gonna gloss over. And instead what I'm gonna focus on is brain regions that we found that were shared. And indeed we found brain regions shared across species and sexes that showed increased activity during parental effort. So then we wanted to kind of zoom out a level of evolutionary comparison and also consider a different type of parental behavior. And so we targeted another focal species um, that is female uniparental. And so two of these species um, on the right here independently evolved this egg provisioning behavior. And so we took again a really similar approach, um, comparing animals not parental to those provisioning eggs. Um, and here too, we found, you know, some similarities and some differences, but some overlapping regions. And one of the brain regions that popped up in all of our comparisons was the preoptic area. And so we found, so just to summarize this, then the preoptic area is associated with parental care across sexes, species, and evolutionary transitions in our frogs. And it's a brain region that has been associated with parental behavior across every vertebrate where people have looked. So um, this felt really satisfying. It was what we expected, but it was also, we were really pleased to see that indeed the preoptic area serves this function in our frogs as well. And so that was really a lot of the starting point for then um, the work that has been happening since then. Oh, and then I'm not gonna talk about this at all, but it's a really fun story. So ask me about it or go read about it. We also found that um, in addition to provisioning nutrition to tadpoles, this egg feeding behavior was actually also a way that moms are able to provision toxins to their tadpoles. And so this is a really cool um, sort of, you know, somewhat tangential story. All right. But so um, given this pattern across these species, um, one of the things we wanted to ask, and so this is sort of in line with this big picture question of mechanistic co-option of how within species variation might be selected on. And so we we're curious, well, does this behavioral variation we see between the species in the different care strategies evolve from behavioral variation within species? And so to get at this question, the next thing we needed to do really was to dig deeper to this um, within species variation. And so um, what I've shown you so far is sort of taking an evolutionary comparative approach and looking at patterns of neural activity. And so what we next wanted to do then um, was to dig a little deeper, look at patterns of gene expression and also think about hormones within species. And so for that, um, we chose the, you can think of them as the blue species, Dendrobates tinctorius which is a male uniparental species. And so during sex typical care, um, males and females mate, we house them in pairs in the lab, but then moms are not really involved in parental care. Um, and this is also the pattern that we are aware of in the wild. And so what I'm gonna show you here is caregiving males in three different phases of parental care, no care. Again, they were experienced, but not caring at the time we sampled them egg care, so taking care of those eggs, and then tadpole transport, which I've told you a little bit about already. 
And then over here in yellow, we're going to have the females in these same stages. But importantly, these are non-caregiving partners of our males. So they're moms, but they're not involved in the behaviors. Um, we just sampled them at the same time that we sampled their male partners. And so what we thought we were going to find here then was to be able to say, OK, um, you know, moms are not caring, dads are caring. Where are the differences? And so the first thing we did was to look at neural activity in the way I've, uh, I talked about already. So this is actually the data I just showed you on the previous slide. Um, and then here are the non-caregiving female comparisons. And so there are things that are lighting up in the females, even though they're not parenting. Um, but importantly, we did find this the difference that we expected in the pre-optic area, where we see differences in activity when males are transporting. We don't see an activity change in non-caregiving females. Um, okay, so that was what we expected. So what about hormones? Um, so just to orient you, again, we've got our same groups here, blue and yellow um, on the x-axis, and then we've got hormone levels on the y-axis. So the first thing I'm going to show you is cortisol. So glossing over the details here, this is sort of classically considered a stress hormone. And so here is what the data look like. Um, we see that there's not a lot of differences between egg care and no care, but there's a marked increase in cortisol levels during parental effort in males. And so the parents in the room are like, yeah, duh, um, being a parent is stressful. Um, so this is actually a pattern we see um, across vertebrates generally that there's increased court during parental effort. But to, so that didn't surprise us. What did surprise us was that we also actually see an increase in females. And so we were like, okay, this isn't quite what we expected, but you know, he's like maybe being a little crazy. Maybe she's stressed out. What about our other hormones? Um, so here we have testosterone. Um, there's a sex difference here, which is the one we would expect more androgens in males. So the blue bars are on average higher. We also see a decrease in testosterone during parental effort. This is again, something that has been observed in lots of vertebrates, including humans. But again, here we were surprised to find that the females actually also have a significant decrease in testosterone. It doesn't look as impressive here because they have much lower baseline testosterone to begin with, um, but this is a significant effect here. So again, we were like, huh. And then finally, we looked at estradiol, and here we see a sex difference, um, so more estrogen type um, compounds in females, but no association with parental stage. Okay, so a little bit surprising in terms of hormones. What about brain gene expression? So let me show you the males first. So I know some of you are used to looking at gene expression heat maps and some of you aren't. So let me just point out what I want you to notice here. So if you look across the top, this tree here is clustering the samples based on similarity. And what you will notice is that the tadpole transport group is really different from the egg care and no care. So this kind of mirrors the hormones, more differences are tadpole transport is most different. And then that's also borne out down here um, where the patterns of gene expression in terms of these guys are upregulated during transport, these guys are downregulated, um, are really different, are most markedly different during transport. So again, this is kind of what we expected. Um, what we did not expect is that we see a really similar pattern in these non-caregiving females. So massive changes in brain gene expression in females during Chad pull transport, even though they are not involved in this behavior. All right, so to come back to this then, right, we were like, what's going on here? Because we have this really perplexing, but also interesting disconnect across levels, where at the levels of gene expression and hormones, males and females look the same. So female, non-caregiving female partners are mirroring what's happening in their males. But at the level of neural activity, we're getting what we expect, where it's really about whether you're actively transporting or not. So we're a little bit perplexed, but we were also pleased because we thought we had a cool way to try to understand this, or we continue to think that, I should say. And that is that I told you these guys are um, male uniparental, but there's actually some flexibility here in which females will occasionally take over caregiving from their male partners. And so we have kind of sex typical care and then we have sex reverse parental care. And we know that we can increase the likelihood of sex reversed care by removing male mates. And so what we thought was, okay, well, let's look at these sex reversed females to try to understand the sex typical data a bit better. 
And so I'm going to show you with the same color scheme, um, the males and their non-caregiving female partners. But what we're adding now is the sex reverse group where we have control females. And these are females that had their mates removed, had hatched tadpoles, but did not transport them versus tadpole transporting females. So mates removed hatched tadpoles and they've taken over care. Okay, so I'm gonna um, summarize a little bit of data here on, neuro on hormones and neural activity. So I'm just gonna show you the preoptic area here, um, again, cause this is sort of like our favorite parental care brain region. Here's the data I showed you before. So increase in neural activity in tadpole transporting males, but not in non-caregiving females. Um, and we see a similar pattern in our control and transporting females in this other sex reverse condition or in the male removal condition. So here, again, neural activity is associated with the active performance of the behavior. If we now look at cortisol again, um, here again, the data I showed you where we saw increased um, court in transporting males as well as their female partners. When we compare now our um, male mate removal groups, we don't actually see any difference between the groups. And so if I had just done this experiment, this would have completely confused me. But in the context of what we knew previously, um, we think this makes sense because basically these non-caregiving females are sort of similar to the controls already. Um, and so the fact that we don't like get an extra bump based on transporting is perhaps less surprising. Um, so kind of the take homes here are also that, you know, so having like this comparative data ended up being really important to our understanding of, of each piece individually. And so just to summarize this, um, we saw hormonal and brain gene expression patterns and tadpole transporting males mirrored in their non-caregiving female partners, sort of surprising to us. But in contrast, neural activity patterns were actually most closely associated with the active performance of the behavior. And so our interpretation of this right now, and what we're really excited about, is that we think that the patterns are related to females monitoring of their male partners and this ability to take over parental care. And so um, again, in terms of also this disconnect across levels, we think, okay, this is a place we can really dig in to understand um, how interactions across levels give rise to behavior or, you know, conversely, not. And in particular, we're excited about this idea of how the same behavior sort of shifts from males to females, because that's what's happening, um, we think also potentially in terms of driving variation between species. Um, and this idea also that a male trait or a female trait can move into the opposite sex has been called cross-sexual transfer. And Mary Jane West Aberhart um, has proposed that this is a major but underappreciated force in the evolution of novel behavior um, in general. And so this is kind of where we're at in our thinking about this and we're excited to pursue this now. And so we're really in the early stages of this project, but I wanna kind of highlight our thinking about how this might work because that's where we're going right now. And so um, if we imagine that, you know, again, behavior is sort of this emergent property, um, we could imagine that we have shared activators, let's call it a hormone, and then shared response modules, let's call it a gene expression network, and that parental behavior or whatever your favorite behavior is, is driven by the same activators and response modules in both males and females. And so maybe the difference is just that, you know, females are not often in the permissive hormonal range for us to observe this behavior. By contrast, we might imagine that perhaps what's going on when we see these transitions is that we have a shared response module, so shared gene expression pattern, but there's somehow a different activator, a different hormone that gains access to that you know, gene expression program in a male versus female. And there's some cool data to suggest that this can occur from other species. Conversely, maybe um, you know, the same hormone at different levels is therefore activating different response modules. And so you can get the same behavior from different gene expression programs. Or finally, maybe things are just totally different. Males and females are using alternative solutions, if you will. And so I'm laying out here kind of these broad bins, um, but this is sort of, and I should also point out, I just said hormones and gene expression modules, um, which is one, set of levels we could think about. But I think 
or what I want you to take from this is really that these are like broad categories that we can use to think about how interactions across levels might contribute to the emergence of novel behavior um, and or to the evolution of behavior. Because the other thing about this cross-level thinking then is that you can sort of have modular structure that might allow you to kind of move well-integrated behaviors around. So this is like where we're trying to go with this. We've got all sorts of plans for gene expression and single cell and all these things. Um, but really the other thing that this work made us realize that was that before we can get at this question of the between species, we actually have a lot more work to done to do understanding behavioral variation within species and setting ourselves up to like get to this next step. Um, and so I'm very fortunate to have a very um, fabulous intrepid um, postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Sarah Westrick, who is interested um, and has lots of experience thinking about individual variation in behavior. And so right now what Sarah is, is thinking about um, is the first steps on this road, thinking about whether dads show consistent variation in behavior. Um, so, you know, is there individual variation and whether that um, translates then to this flexibility where sometimes females will take over. And so do moms have a consistent propensity to care? And so something I want to point out here, and I'm going to just briefly hop on the soapbox, is that, right, so these are data I showed you before. Um, and before, everything I was talking about was like these differences between groups, parental and non-parental. But if you look at these, bo these bars that are in the red boxes, there is lots of variation within group there. And so... Something that I think is a disconnect a bit between fields is that as evolutionary biologists and um, people who study animal behavior, we are often interested in individual variation. But neurobiologists and people who study mechanisms are often trying to minimize the within group variation. So, to, so they think of that individual variation more as noise um, and are really focused on the between group. But our assumption is inherently that between group variation comes from selection on individual level variation. And so we think it's really important to try to merge these two things. Um, but of course, that is not easy. And you will see that in a moment here um, in terms of what the project that Sarah has chosen to do. So to get at this question of individual variation, right, we know that the animal's parent, um, we know from some of the data that there is variation, but we don't know a lot about it. So Sarah um, has set up this video monitoring system. So this is an image from a camera. Um, here is a pool. So this is now in the lab. You saw this behavior in the wild. Here are these coconut condos where um, the frogs leave their eggs. And so we can monitor which condo they're in. Are they with the eggs? How long are they there, et cetera? And then just also to show you, this is sped up. Um, but here is a dad with a tadpole on his back. And so they do a really similar behavior in our lab as what I showed you earlier in the field. And so now we can monitor this um, remotely and get way more detailed information on how long are they carrying them, um, how much time are they spending with eggs, et cetera. So here is this video array that Sarah has set up. And so here is why the neurobiologists are not often looking at individual variation. So for a sample size of nine dads, um, Sarah has looked across multiple clutches and that has resulted in 3000 hours of video and over nine terabytes of video data that need to be analyzed to get this individual level data. So this is obviously quite the task. Um, and so we are, or I should say Sarah is eyeball deep in piles and piles of data, but I'm really happy that I do have a little bit of her data to share already, um, but lots to stay tuned for. But so here is um, a graph of tadpole transport probability across time. Um, the median time to transport, so from eggs being laid to tadpoles getting carried is 23 days. But already something I think really cool that Sarah has found is that there's a huge range. There's a 20 day range in how long these dads basically care for eggs before they carry tadpoles. And given that the median is 20 days, that's crazy. That's a huge amount of variation. And so if I break this down now into each dad individually, you can see that there's variation both within and across dads. So Sarah has monitored dads through multiple clutches. And so I'm gonna just take this data and show it to you a different way. And so each color is a different dad. Um, so you can see there's multiple clutches for each parent and so, um, and multiple tadpoles that they're transporting. And so what I think is super cool here is that you can see that some dads are clearly waiting longer on average, even though there's variation within that dad to transport tadpoles, whereas other dads are consistently transporting sooner. 
Um, and so we're excited about this because there is variation here, which is sort of a prerequisite for a lot of the other things we wanna do. Sarah has collected tons of hormone data on these animals, which we're analyzing. And we also have been tracking the tadpoles of these dads to try to get it. Well, okay, there's variation here. What are the consequences for offspring? So stay tuned for lots to come. Um, and then I'll also just point out that this video system has also been really great because it's allowing us to capture cool, rare events. So here is a tadpole. Here is dad transporting a tadpole. And here is, in this case, mom transporting a tadpole at the same time. And so, um, you know, we're also now seeing these rare events and really understanding interactions between parents um, with much more subtlety than we could before. Okay, I'm gonna have a sip of water. So that sort of wraps up um, this section on mechanisms of parental care. And I'm gonna to transition to talking about feeding and social behavior, um, but point out that actually this parental care work led directly to the next few things I'm gonna tell you about. So without worrying at all about the details of where this graph came from, um, I'm just gonna tell you that as a postdoc, I also did a couple of different gene expression studies looking at parental behavior. So I showed you some of that data already. Um, we did another set of gene expression um, studies, which is what this graph is from, looking specifically at gene expression in behaviorally relevant neurons. And something that kept happening was that we kept having these genes popping out as, as changing um, based on parental behavior that really are most classically associated with um, feeding and foraging kinds of behaviors. And so at first we were like, oh, gene expression studies, you always get weird stuff. Um, but then of course, you know, we doing our due diligence went and, and started reading around. Um, and basically what we realized is that this is not uncommon. And so we were like, and so we, um, Building on work by others, um, my postdoc advisor and I wrote this review article thinking about the evolution of feeding circuits and social behavior as kind of variations on a theme. And so it turns out that many animals, when they go from being solitary to parental or social, um, and I realize I'm doing IGB a disservice here because we don't have bees um, listed here, which are also really prominent examples um, exist in bees that these molecules that we think of sort of as related to feeding behavior are actually often changing in these social transitions. And so, you know, going back to the big picture that I set up earlier, we got really excited about this as an idea for like, this is how co-option might occur. So we know there's connections at the behavioral level where, you know, being social or being parental is energetically costly. So you need to balance energetics. Oftentimes being parental um, for many species also means you need to tamp down um, aggressive or like cannibalistic kinds of behaviors. Um, and so this led us to wonder, well, where are these connections at underlying levels? And why, might we be able to use like a goal-directed feeding behavior, kind of co-opt those mechanisms into building a more complex goal-directed behavior like parental care? And so right now in my lab, there's a couple places we're excited um, in terms of applying this thinking. We're continuing on the parental care route that I just showed you, um, but we also have other projects where we're thinking about this. And one of them is looking at the tadpoles. So also thinking about recipients of care. So here is a tadpole, Dendrobates tinctorius, so that same blue species I've been talking about um, on the back of dad in this case. And this animal is looking very sweet, um, but what you don't appreciate is that this is in fact a ruthless killer. So these tadpoles have these crazy mouth parts and both in the wild and the lab, they will kill and cannibalize both con and heterospecific tadpoles. And so just to show you what this looks like, here are two tadpoles. Um, these guys don't even have arms and they're just like beating the crap out of each other. There's these sad little bits of floating tadpole here. Um, and so we don't let them do go on in the lab, but they will eventually kill each other if we let them. Um, and so what we think is really interesting in this context of feeding and social behavior is that this is an aggressive interaction, um, but it's also means that there's like a conflict here in terms of what a social partner, what a conspecific means to you. On the one hand, potentially very threatening. On the other hand, potentially a meal. 
And so we think this is an interesting place to think about these connections, um, especially because I showed you this earlier, but what I didn't tell you is that there's also a relationship here with tadpole aggression. So species also vary in how aggressive they are. And so ultimately we here too have an opportunity to do some comparative work. And so again, we're at the start of these projects here, um, but my graduate student, Lisa, um, is generally interested in behavioral plasticity. And so she um, has jumped into the deep end on thinking about how conspecific cues influence tadpole behavior, given these kind of conflicting um, outcomes of social interactions. And so the first thing Lisa did was to try to ask the tadpoles, well, how do you even feel about these different cues, right? So what she did was that she took a cue that's obviously good, food, a cue that's obviously bad, a predator, um, cues from conspecifics, which question mark, you know, this could be good or could be bad. Um, and so she used two cues of conspecifics, one here where it was just holding water. So there's all factory cues um, that other tadpoles are around. And one, um, which I'm gonna call injured conspecific here in which Lisa basically crushed up a tadpole. Um, and so a conspecific cue, but somewhat of a different nature. And so we really wanted to sort of ask, if you will, the tadpoles, well, how are you interpreting these, cons these different kinds of conspecific cues? And so what we needed was a sort of agnostic way to survey behavior. And what we settled on was an open field test. So this is a test where here you're seeing a speed sped up video. We just put a tadpole in a bucket um, and we see what it does. And so Lisa put these different cues into the water in this bucket. Importantly, she filtered out all the particulates. So they're not able to directly eat. They just can kind of smell the food. And then what we can do using automated tracking software is to track the movements of these tadpoles and ask how far are you moving? How much of the time are you moving? And then also how are you using the space? So on um, these little quadrants here, we can break this up into areas. And then this is essentially a heat map where you can see the tadpole spent less time in the middle where it's blue and more time along the edges. And so I'm just gonna show you a little bit of data here. Um, so this is proportion of time spent moving. So how much did they move? And we found that the tadpoles move most in response to food. So clearly food is sending them different signals than other things. Um, oh, I should also note, we do have also a control treatment where they're just in plain holding water. In contrast, if we look at, um, areas explored, so how they're using the space, they explore the most areas in response to a cue of conspecific injury. And so we're still kind of wrapping our head around why they might be behaving this way. Um, you know, there are all, the data are not like the cleanest data we've ever seen. But what I think is really important here is that what we can say is that these tadpoles are clearly interpreting these different cues in different ways. So an injured conspecific is not the same as just a food cue, but it's also not exactly the same as a cue of a conspecific. And so we're really excited to, to follow up on this um, and to also understand how these cues then influence the propensity for aggressive behavior. And so I, as a postdoc, um, did a little bit of work on neural mechanisms of aggression in these tadpoles. So we have some starting points there and Lisa has been diligently collecting a bunch of brains. Um, Lisa has also been rearing her tadpoles in different environments. So what I showed you was kind of acute cue exposure. We're also interested in what happens when you have longer term developmental exposure. And then ultimately getting back at this question of how sort of fed and unfed states relate to um, the social aggression kinds of phenotypes and how that's being regulated at underlying levels is their overlap and the kinds of molecules that are important. Um, and then finally, I'll just point out, we also are excited about tadpoles because we think that they're really promising for functional manipulations. And so being able to kind of validate what we're finding and to go the other way, change the expression of a gene and see if it changes aggressive behavior. Okay, and then the other place we're excited about this social and feeding behavior sort of changing gears here is in these um, guys here, Eleutherodactylus koki. And so um, I'm really excited. We just got um, uh, led by my postdoc, Sarah, who I mentioned earlier. We wrote a review about these guys. They have many fine features. Um, and this was part of this um, Natural History of Model Organisms series in eLife, which um, I'm mostly bringing this up because if you're not familiar with that series, I strongly encourage you to look at it. It's really awesome. Um, and other people like Mark Hauber, who I know is an audience, also have published in this. And it's, it's just a really great series. Um, 
But so why are we excited about the Koki in this context? Well, they also provide parental care, independent transition to parental behavior in frogs, and they have this interesting egg cannibalism behavior. And what's important is that they do this both, I'm gonna call it offensively and defensively. So um, males will cannibalize the eggs of other males, both to acquire resources and sort of as a competitive behavior, but they also will cannibalize their own eggs if it seems like their brood is gonna fail. So at the behavioral level, again, super interesting connections between, you know, how do you decide when to cannibalize and when to care? How are those circuits, which are clearly in opposition being regulated? Can you tell the difference between your own eggs and somebody else's and so on. And so we think given this interesting behavior, it's also a really cool place to go in and figure out how this is working at an underlying level. And then more broadly, these animals are making decisions that trade off with other kinds of behaviors as well. And energetics is a core part of this, right? So do you eat your own eggs so that you can also use that energy to go and find another mate? Um, and so this thinking we think can also apply even more broadly to just thinking about how animals make decisions and how these like core feeding foraging kinds of molecules might be important in mediating those decisions. And then finally, um, I just want to point out the last thing we're really excited about right now in the lab, um, which is that all this thinking of kind of big picture, like co-option and feeding and social behavior, we also kind of looked at our frogs and we were like, man, the other thing frogs are really doing to be parents is osmoregulating, right? And there's some molecules important in osmoregulation, like arginine vasopressin, for those of you who are familiar, that are like classically implicated in social behavior. And so, you know, can we also apply a similar kind of co-option rationale to thinking about osmoregulation and parental care. And here we've got these delightful glass frogs in the lab now. So they're see-through, which in addition to just being mind-boggling, means that we actually have the ability to trace water flow in live animals in cool ways. Um, and they also show parental behavior across different species with different care strategies. So again, we're excited about our ability to ask this question in a comparative way. Okay, so just to zoom back out and sort of um, wrap this up here. So um, I hope that what I've left you with is that in my lab right now, we're interested in how novel behaviors evolve and we're thinking about how behavioral and mechanistic co-option might influence that. And so the kind of crumb trails we're following right now are thinking about sex differences in parental care, thinking about feeding and social behavior, and also thinking about osmoregulation and parental care. And then I want to point out, you know, like why frogs? Okay, so they're really stinking cute, obviously. Um, but again, even though um, parental care has only is only exhibited by 10% of species, I've shown you today three different families that independently evolved it, where there is this variation between these families, independent transitions. There's also variation within families. And I didn't talk about all the other behavioral variation we see. So we just think that frogs in general are actually a really great group to do this comparative kind of work. Um, and it's been really gratifying to see that um, the neuroscience community is also really getting on board with the fact that comparative work is going to be important um, for us to understand sort of fundamental core principles of how behavior works and to translate that also um, further into, you know, drug development and things that are that are more medically relevant. Okay, so with that, I really want to thank the members of my lab and especially um, Sarah and Lisa, whose work I highlighted. Also, Samta Ozo was an undergraduate summer REU student who helped Lisa. Um, a lot of the work I showed was also postdoc work that I did in the O'Connell lab, so shout out to them. Um, funding, um, all the support I'm getting from people here at the university. It's been a crazy time to start a job, um, and I feel really fortunate at um, how much help I have received. Um, and then also many frog room helpers, and of course you for your attention. The end. <laughs> so anticlimactic on Zoom. Yay. Well, Ava, I'm sure that if we were in person, we would be hearing lots of claps and seeing some reactions in the audience now. Thank you so much <laughs> for that great talk. Um, just a reminder to everybody, you could put your questions in the chat. Already seeing some uh, questions appearing. So I'll go ahead and, um, and start reading them out. Uh, so first question is from Robert Karn, who's asking, how strong are the reproductive barriers between species that are in contact? Is there much gene flow between any of them? Is there a hybrid zone between any of them that could be used to study potential hybrid behaviors? 
Yeah. Awesome. So, um, the, so like basically every question you all will ask me, I'll be like, it really depends. And we really don't know. Um, so there are species that hybridize in the wild, but something that's actually really fascinating about poison frogs in particular is that there are lots of post-zygotic barriers. So for example, we have species, I cannot tell them apart in the lab. Like, unless you tell me who's who I'm like, I can't visually tell these apart, but when they call, they are really, really different. And so we think, right, these animals distinguish each other clearly in the wild. So they're not hybridizing, but it's largely post-psychotic. And so we think that we can make hybrids in the lab if we want. And so this is something I've thought about, like, can we take a male uniparental and a biparental species, make hybrids and just like, say like, what do you do? Right. Um, and so that is something I've thought about. And then there are some, I mean, there are some hybrid zones in the wild where we could potentially work. Um, some of the more mechanistic stuff we try to do mostly in the lab because a lot of these animals are having a tough time in the wild. And so um, we don't like to collect them necessarily in the wild, um, which is also why poison frogs are great because they have long been of interest in the pet trade and they will breed readily in the lab. Excellent. Uh, we have another question here from um, Becky Fuller. Uh, who's asking, are the frogs monogamous? Do they mate multiply? The reason I ask is because lots of folks think about how there are conflicts of interest between the sexes in parental care, but this doesn't seem to be a big part of the story here, but you might not expect those conflicts if they're monogamous. Just curious um, if the question is correct. Yeah, and so again, like this is where the species variation in these frogs is amazing. So um, one of the species I showed you briefly is truly genetically monogamous and biparental. Many of the other species are not monogamous. The blue species actually is sort of sexed or reversed where it's the females that seem to be the bullies and they aggress each other and try to monopolize mates. In other species, it's the males that are aggressive and the females that are choosy. So basically the answer is like, we see lots of variation um, in the lab we're housing them in pairs so we haven't explored that but I do have like dreams that we will set up like a rainforest room and like tag everybody and just watch how they're interacting um, because there is clearly conflict so like as another example females will eat the eggs of other females um, even if it's like the same dad so they also use this cannibalist cannibalism in like this competitive way um, and so, yeah, so there's lots and lots of variations. So basically we can find the different patterns. And again, I think that's what's so cool about the system is like evolution already created the variation for us. And now we can go in and kind of um, exploit it to understand how that is working. Great, we've got a question from Paul Bontus here who's asking, what is the sex determining factor in poison frog species, genetic sex chromosome? Would you expect that the social cue for sex reverse parental care to be chemical, e.g. pheromone or behavioral interaction with the other sex? So in terms of sex determining factor, so it looks like it's chromosomal, right? Just um, in frogs in general, they seem to have chromosomal sex determination. However, it's very squishy. So um, it's they don't have a sex chromosome. It ends up on autosomes. There may be more than one locus that influences sex. And so we would like to develop sex markers, but we may or may not be able to because other people have, for example, developed sex markers in one population and they work great. And then in another population of the same species, they don't work um, because they like, while it's chromosomal, it's, it's much more flexible than like we think of in mammals or birds. Um, and so there's the answer to that. We would like, we want to try to get some sex markers going. So we or there's like, that's one of many side projects happening right now. Um, in terms of what the cue is, I mean, this is something I'm really curious about and we don't know. And so another postdoc in my lab, um, whose work I didn't talk about today, she is really interested in this question of what cues are they using to decide when to take over parental care? Is it visual? Is it auditory? Is it hormonal? Um, and so Jen Moss is uh, exploring that. And so I hope to have more answers for you sometime soon. They touch each other a lot also, which we don't really understand why, like during courtship, they touch each other a lot. Um, and so we think there's chemical signaling that we don't understand. All right, we've got a question from Jean Robinson who asks, putting together the two great parts of your talk, do you think the mechanistic and evolutionary relationships between feeding and social behavior vary by sex? 
Yeah, interesting question. So I don't know. I mean, I think on some level, something that is also appealing about the like, or well, I should zoom out and say, right, something that is interesting about sex differences in the brain is that they're really obvious in behavior, but there's lots of parts of the brain that actually are really similar between males and females because they have to do lots of the same stuff like eat. And so um, I think the feeding sort of social behavior paradigm is also an interesting place to think about this because we we probably expect or we sort of expect feeding maybe to be more similar, um, but I don't think we know. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I, this is something we're also curious about. And certainly if we think, for example, or another reason I think this is interesting, not that my work directly will address this, but if we look at um, human diseases, for example, there's lots of behavioral disorders where food is part of it. And many behavioral disorders we know have different propensities in males and females, right? And so you know, clearly there's something going on there that we don't fully understand. And so, but thinking about that and also thinking about like how you switch behaviors from males to females, like maybe that can help us kind of start to, to see some patterns there or to understand some bigger picture stuff. I told you guys I would answer every question with, I don't know, but I'd like to. <laughs> We've got a question here from Mark Hauber who says, hi, I have a great talk. Um, how would your tadpoles know what a predator smell is? Did you feed tadpoles to the predators before you collected their scent, perhaps? Um, we did not. Um, so there's previous work that uh, demonstrates that they seem to have some like innate fear um, of of dragonfly larvae in particular, but yeah, so it, it is, that is a really excellent point. It is an unfamiliar, uh, unfamiliar predator scent to them, um, though it is like an ecologically relevant one, but they were not exposed to it beforehand in the lab. Um, I should also point out though, and I mean, this is maybe sort of relevant, I showed you the data. And so all the tadpoles were exposed to all the cues in a randomized order. Um, and so, I mean, that doesn't help with this being a novel cue, but um, we did try to control sort of for effects of order. And we do see that tadpoles are also individually repeatable. So if you're more scared, you're more scared in response to, you know, all the scary cues or what have you. So, but yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, again, like we also, so some of our collaborators and Lisa's really interested in doing field work and trying to understand like what kinds of cues are around in natural pools and what kind of predators are around. And some of our um, collaborators have started in on that. And so we know it's ecologically relevant, but it was novel to them in the lab. Uh, we've got, have, how about one, one more question and then we'll maybe open it up if people want to um, unmute, they can ask questions too, just to stay a few more minutes. But last uh, question in the chat is from Rainer Gillette, who, uh, who says, best seminar of the year. Uh, regarding biparental care, is there competition between the sexes for tadpoles? Is there intersexual aggression involved? And if so, what's the nature? Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm realizing maybe I should like make it a policy to only give seminars in January so that I can say, well, I've given the best seminar of the year. Um, so in the biparental species, they seem to be, so we haven't really looked at sexual conflict, but they seem to be pretty cooperative. Um, they're not that we can tell very aggressive to each other. Um, there's also work that suggests that they're really like our pair bonding in that species. So they recognize their partners and so on. Um, so we don't see a ton of aggression between partners. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else to, and so one thing that is also interesting actually is, so in the biparental species, it's usually dad who transports the tadpoles, but if anything, we see more cooperation in the sense that in that species, moms are much more likely to also transport just sort of spontaneously than in other species that are, are uniparental. So there's variation in this, there's variation in the flexibility, that's a weird sentence. Um, but so yeah, not a lot of aggression and it, it doesn't like, there doesn't seem to be competition really. I don't know if that, I, did I answer your question, Rainer? I don't know if I answered it. Um, yeah, so I will open it up actually. Uh, if anybody wants to turn off their um, uh, mute, feel free to ask a question. Any others before we close?
Thanks, Becky. All right, well, thank you everybody for joining us and thanks uh, to Ava for that very stimulating, exciting seminar. And we'll look forward to uh, yeah. doing an update. Yeah, well, thank you everyone for coming and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck getting back into the semester. Bye. Bye. Bye.